Well, hello and welcome to the Hope Cymru Talk Show. I'm Marcus Nelson and today it's a great joy and privilege to be joined by a man who needs no introduction from me, Dr. Rowan Williams. Rowan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's, uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. It's very kind of you to, to give us your time in this way. Today we're looking at the beginning of the Bible. Hmm. The, uh, the most popular book, it may, it's the top of all the bestseller lists, so they don't even put it on to make the others not quite <laughs> feel as bad about things. And in 1968, I think it was Bill Anders, wasn't it? You know, the, the, uh, the uh, space mm. craft had passed lunar orbit and was struggling to find words to be able to mm. articulate that experience, looking down in the world yeah. in that way, and famously read Genesis chapter Come 1. On. Mm. For a long time, is it true, Rowan, that those that read Genesis 1 were encouraged not to until they were over the age of 30, and it was held in such awe and reverence? There were, in Jewish tradition, a number of bits of the Bible that yes, you, yeah. you only read at your own peril, so yes. to speak. And people talk about the mystery of creation and the mystery of the chariot in Ezekiel, mm. the vision of the chariot. And yes, you, you were encouraged to, to leave meditation on those until you'd got past primary school, as it were, past the, <laughs> yes, the first stages. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Those, were, those were very, very deep things. Sometimes uh, the, the impression that has been given is that, you know, Genesis, those early chapters of Genesis are written in crayon almost you know there's not there's nothing terribly deep and complex about it but the way in which they've been received for a very very long time mm. would mean that actually there are profound mm. mysteries that are being opened up in these chapters that they really are profound mysteries and i think the more you look at it at the text of genesis 1 and 2 the more you realize what subtlety there is in in the writing these are not primitive texts in any kind of um, derogatory sense. These are, in the, in the best sense, very literary. Somebody's thought about the placing of every word. And so the Jewish rabbis are not wrong to take the microscope yes. to these words. And it's, it's quite likely that the very first chapter of Genesis is in fact one of the later bits of the Bible to be written in that form. Because this is, if you like, a distillation of what generations of people have been discovering in the lived experience of God's people, which is then, as it were, projected back onto the screen of the beginning of all things. Very interesting if you look at um, some of the texts in Isaiah, for example, the experience of Israel being taken out of slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea is kind of projected back onto the very beginning of things. Yes. God leads creation out of chaos. Yes. Into, into order, just as the slaves are led through the Red Sea to Sinai to receive the law of God so that they can live more fully. Yes. And that coming together is, is part of what's going on throughout the whole history of God's people. And that, and that famous opening, in the beginning. In the beginning, in yep. One word in the original, what, what, what's being driven mm. up by that one word mm. with which the, the scriptures open? Breshit, in the beginning. Um, and the Reshit element relates to Rosh, which is the head, the source, the head waters. And one way of reading the first verse is not exactly in the beginning God created, but at the head waters of God's making of heaven and earth, right at the start of God's action. So you're, you might say creation has already happened before. It starts in that moment of headwaters springing up, the, the source of all things, there's only chaos. The first thing that happens is chaos. <clears throat> and then God breathes out onto it. The, the spirit of God or the mighty spirit, the mighty breath that moves over the chaos. And then as that spirit penetrates, bit by bit, the world yes. springs into ordered life. And that's a, a deeply sophisticated account of the beginning of things. Because if you look at the creation stories of world mythology, yes. Greek, Babylonian, um, Nordic, whatever, usually you have some kind of model of there being lots of stuff around mm, and yes. the gods kind of fiddle around with it mm. and make something out of it. 
But here, no. no. Here you just have that absolute calm moment mm. of declaration. Let there be. Yes. The wonderful new book, if I may do a yes, yes. commercial promotion, <laughs> by the great American novelist Marilyn Robinson called Reading Genesis. Mm. And she, in this book, simply goes through the book of Genesis chapter by chapter. Mm. And at the start, she says, one of the big differences between what you see in Genesis 1 and what you see in the rest of the ancient world, really, in the mythologies, is in these mythologies, the gods often make the world for various reasons. The making of the world is part of their own complicated interaction, their life together. Between one another, yeah. yes. But God makes this world to be good, to give joy, not to him, but yes. for itself. The world, writes Mary Robinson, is, is suited to human enjoyment. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, in anticipation of human pleasure, which the Lord presumably shares. This is an extremely elegant detail. The beauty of the trees is noted before the fact that they yield food. It is a rich goodness that the Lord intended and created for our experience. Mm. Now, that vision, she says, of a God who makes a world of order and beauty so that there may be joy yes. and delight. That, I, th I think she's absolutely right, that is so unique yes. to the way the Bible tells the story for the beginning of things. Yes. This world is there so that God may rejoice in it and so that the world may share Joy. Yes, absolutely. And it's a, it's a far better origin <coughs> and vision than the one god killing another god oh, and its yes, decaying yes, corpse yes. becoming That's the foundations exactly. of the heavens and the earth. Do you think that, yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a much better version. <laughs> Is there a sense in which, you know, the way in which Augustine <coughs> argues that Plato had perhaps in some way come into contact with these things? and has a fragmentary mm. understanding of it. Do you think that there could be yeah. a sense in which these other accounts are trying to capture something which they're not fully able to articulate? Mm. It's a good question, I think, because yes, lots of early Christian writers think um, Plato and the Greek philosophers must have read yes, yeah. the Torah. I think that's wildly unlikely, but I think what the early Christian writers have spotted is that there is something about the biblical account which takes you beyond mythology, closer to philosophy, not in an abstract way, but in yes. you know, really profound questioning about the nature of reality. So that a Plato writing about the beginning of things can say things that mythology doesn't say. And people like Augustine or other Christian apologists in the, the early centuries recognize there's an affinity between what the philosopher is after and what the first chapter of Genesis is doing. In other words, it's, it's stripping away the idea that you can, you can tell interesting stories about God. Um, stripping away the idea that the doings of the gods are real and accessible. Yes. It's saying, there, forget all that. Yes. There is one everlasting life which brings into being something that is not itself purely for the joy of it. Yes, yeah. And the sons of God shouted for joy. Yes, that's joy. a joke yeah, fantastic. How did, how did Augustine understand <clears throat> the, in the beginning, you know, Bereshit in uh, the city of God in, t in terms of relationship with Christ and like, mm. his place as the eternal son of the Father at the beginning of all things? I think in every early Christian writer of any stature that identification of Christ with the beginning um, becomes crucial because in understanding Jesus Christ as the embodiment of the everlasting word of God, you have to say that the whole order of the created world is in some sense oriented towards the event of, of Jesus. And in him, everything unfolds. He holds things together, says St. Paul. And um, when Origen in Alexandria in the, um, the third century writes his commentary on St. John's Gospel, he spends most of the first book on the words yes. in the beginning and goes yes. through all the, the ways in which beginning can work 
it's a temporal beginning, but it's also a first principle, the, the organizing principle of things. Yes. It's the point to which you, you have to keep going back to recover what you are, and it goes through all the ways in which that, that can be said of Christ. So, yes, it's not, um, as we sometimes rather stupidly think, God the Father made the world, and God the Son redeemed it. Yes, yes. And God the Holy Spirit somehow hangs around to yes, cheer us up. Absolutely. Yeah. But that the entire interrelated love of God is what makes yes, the world from the start. Yes. And the world is made in and for the eternal word. Yes. You can't I, take the Trinity out of I that equation. I love the way Oregon describes in that section, you know, when the apostles announce good news, they mean simply Jesus. I think it's yeah. such a fantastic yes. way of describing yes. it, isn't it? In that way, Ron, just help us to understand, you know, I know Calvin speaks about it in the Institutes, that description of, you know, from the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit, mm. just that, mm. the pattern and mm. ordering of the way in which the Father, Son, and Spirit work. Yeah. Not for the first time, Calvin is very close to some of the, the Greek fathers of the early church. I, when I want to be provocative, I sometimes say John Calvin is the last of the Greek, yes, Greek fathers. Yes. Um, because <laughs> what they call the order of God's, the taxis yes. of God's work is, is crucial to how they see things. Um, they're not saying it's a temporal order, first there's the Father, then there's the Son, then there's the Holy Spirit. But there is a sort of logical interrelation between the source and the outcome. Um, they're simultaneous, but they're related as source and product, yes, you might yes. say. So yes, everything from the Father, because the Father is the source of, of everything. But as soon as you say that, you put alongside the Father that which he's the source of, yes. which is the word and the wisdom and the spirit. So from the Father, through the Son, because as the Father produces, generates from his heart that everlasting response to him, which is the Son, that opens up the possibility of a world which is different, yes. which will share the life of the Son, so through the Son. And how does that extend to creation? In the Spirit. Because just as at the beginning God breathes life into creation, so through Christ this life-giving breath comes and incorporates us. So, and that's not just about us as human beings, but in some sense, the spirit is active in the entire creation, uniting it with Christ and directing it to the Father. As St. Paul says in Romans chapter eight, you know, this is not just about us, it is about the entire creation, restored through Christ to where it ought to be, yes. by the power of the spirit. And the, fa the father's relationship with the son then being the, the possibility for another to exist alongside That's right. each other, That's not, right. not begrudging that being yep. in any way. How does Bart understand that in terms of the temporal analog? Oh, yes. Temporal analog is a good way of putting it because you can't say, I think, that God becomes the father of the son because of creation. That's what some people no, yes, tend to say. Yeah, I'm very wary of that <laughs> one. But certainly the creation of the world is what it is because God is the father of the yes. son. An analog in that sense that spelled out in the history of time and space is the, at least the potential relationship of intimacy and union with the source of all things that is eternally modeled and eternally real in God's life. Yes. And he, as the, the logos, the logic and blueprint of all yeah. reality then, as Oregon had it, provides the, the framework, the basis the framework, for the outwork yes. of everything else. Yes, that's right. The, uh, the fundamental shape of connection between things in the world. When Paul says in Colossians that everything hangs together yes. in Christ. I think that tells us a great deal about how yes. the first Christian generations understood that. Yes, and that's a remarkable thing. Do you think, everyone, is there a sense in which those three descriptions of the way in which everything is made, you know, by him, mm -hmm. Colossians 1, yeah. uh, held together in him, mm -hmm. through him, through. and then also for, for him, him as well, is there a sense in which the, all of that is contained almost in that opening preposition of bear? Yeah. at the very beginning of Genesis 1. Yeah, 
in, in the beginning, um, Christ is the beginning through him, and in him, the world is made. And in that making, almost at the same moment, the spirit is breathed out. So yes, there's, there is a, a Trinitarian reading of the very first verse of Genesis, I think. And so the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who have lived through infinity ages, bringing the cosmos, the creation, the cosmos into being out of the overflow of their own love and that's kindness. Right. That's right. Why is it then, Ron, that when they initially make it in this account of Genesis chapter 1, that it's not full of light and glory and wonder and formed and filled, but rather is formless, empty and dark? Mm. Why, is, why is it that brief interval? Yeah. I think it's, as much as anything, a recognition that this world is a world of timed change. And right from the start, you have to understand that this is a world which doesn't achieve its good and its life like that. Yes. And that says something quite important about us, that when the Creator God works upon us, there's a great deal of um, yes. muddle and chaos over which the Spirit has to, yes. has to float. Yes. So I, th I think it's saying that. It's not that God snaps his fingers and instantly everything's fine. But that the very sort of basic primordial elements needed to coalesce and come together will have to take time. It, it's, it's a curious kind of anticipation, you might say, of almost of an evolutionary picture, mm. that the world doesn't spring into being all at once. It, under God, it puts itself together. Yes. First of all, um, solid and liquid separate out, light shines, light gives life, the earth is fertilized, plant life begins, somehow that shifts into the organic life of animals in the water, the dry land emerges, it's, it's a, a credible evolutionary picture, you might say, just jammed into just a few verses. Um, and you, you find a very um, matter-of-fact acceptance of that time-taking emergence of creation in lots of early Christian writing, like St. Gregory of Nyssa when he writes about creation. And the, the commentaries of the early Christian theologians on the six days of creation, there are quite a few texts like that. And they're very scientifically acute in the terms of their own day, and yes. still have something to say now. So, yes, we live in a world that takes time. We live in a world that takes time. I'm moving away from the when question, Rowan, to the other one of the where questions. Mm. So before this point, the Father, Son, and Spirit have been all that there is. Mm. Where, where, where is the space for the universe <laughs> opened up precisely? You know, well, where, where does that? Yeah. You know, the you know Maltman, Kilimore, mm. others have thought about these things. What, what do you think about just the, where exists? Two lines of thought on that, I suppose. One is um, the one that has its origins in Jewish speculation that in some sense God has to withdraw to make space. Yes. It's what the Kabbalistic Jewish theologians called zimzum, the withdrawing, God putting back the skirts of his yes. robe yes. so that there will be room. Um, I think another rather more mainstream line would say, well, you don't have to think of God having to make space because the life of God is never in competition with what is made. It's not that there has to be less of God for there to yes. be more of the world. Yes. And I think both of those models have something to be said for them. On the one hand, you might say, for God to make the world is for God, <laughs> for God to decide not to be everything. Yes. And to, um, to create a world which is a world of risk mm. and change, mm. a world which is not like his own stability. Yes. And in that creation, God implicitly commits to whatever cost there is in that relationship. On the other hand, let's be clear, God doesn't have to be less God for the world to be the world. Yes. Yes. And we make a really fundamental mistake if we think the world can't be what it is unless God is pushed to the margin. Yes. And that runs right through our religious thinking and feeling, doesn't it? And very often we talk and behave as if the more God, the less human, the more yes. human, the less God. Yes. Whereas at the heart of our faith is Jesus Christ who has 
totally God and totally human. Yes. And there's no contradiction or, or competition. So, yes, I, I don't think we're called on to make a final decision about that. Well, yes. I think we can, we can look at the, the positives on both sides. But I think it is important to remember that in the most basic sense, with all due respect to theologians like Maltzman and to the Kabbalistic Jewish tradition, in one sense, God doesn't have to make space because God is just God and nothing yes. is indifferent to that. Yes. God's infinite reality works at a different level from, from ours. Not a problem. And yet, and yet, there's yes. that, that further issue that if you think about it in terms of the relation between God and what is made, you might almost say God has to make a space in his, can we say this, almost in his imagination mm. for the other in relation yes. with the other. But not begrudging in not that begrudging, sense because no. No. of this life between the Father, Son, mm. Spirit through infinity. There's nothing just, lacking. Yeah, nothing yeah, lacking. Absolutely. And there's mm. not. It, to, to do that doesn't go against the grain of his being no. in any way, which it would quite, quite if the he was monadic. Yeah, quite the opposite. Of pouring off that. And again, it's a point that um, Marilyn Robinson makes wonderfully in her commentary on Genesis by contrasting that with the way in which in Babylonian mythology, um, the relation between the gods and humanity is you know, it's a bit, yes. bit uneasy. Yes, yes. And the flood in Babylonian mythology yes. is really something to do with conflict between the gods and human beings rather than the judgment of God on the failure yes. of human beings and the gracious restoration of that relationship. Yes. And I think she's, she's so right in seeing that as a, an absolute step change from the mythological approach. Yes. And is there a sense in which the, the account of you know, formless, empty, dark, has parallels later on you know, in the prophets? So Jer Jeremiah describes yeah. the land in his days as right. like falling, heavens, it? yeah, yes. falling back into yeah. formlessness. And so is there an absence <laughs> in one sense of the presence of the living God, which then let there be light mm. That he's, he's like sent into it in this I, new and distinct way. I think we're back here to the unity that is seen between the saving acts of God and the creating acts of God yes. in the Old Testament. Yes. So, whenever God is active to save, to recreate, mm. to rescue, it's a kind of recap yes. of that yes. beginning. And whenever we are in need of saving and rescue, we are slithering back. Yes. towards that um, shapelessness, because the shape we're called to live into is the shape, ultimately, of Christ's faithfulness to the Father. Yes. That's the thing that holds, holds creation in one. And so, yes, um, not surprising that in the prophetic literature especially, you have that superimposing, you might say, of the rescue from exile, the deliverance from Egypt, yes. the creation from nothing. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're all the same creative act, mm. the something out of nothing act, yes. the order out of chaos act. Mm. Yes, and, and that image of the, the spirit hovering, yeah. the same word used in Deuteronomy yeah. uh, 32, and the parallel as well, almost at the, the flood, you know, the dove being sent out, coming and, back and then not returning, yep. and then in the baptism in the River Jordan, the man standing in the water, and then the and dove. Indeed, and of course, in the story of the Annunciation, the power yeah, of the Most High will overshadow. Overshadowing, yes, that's overshadowing. And the Spirit, and, the spirit does exactly and that. And just draw, join those dots for us, sorry, Ruin. So, in terms of the overshadowing, Luke chapter 1, like mm. what's, how does that relate to Genesis chapter 1 in that way? I think we are. We are being dug in the ribs by Luke. Saying, what does yes. that remind you of? Yes. You know, because <laughs> Absolutely. here is Jesus being brought into being in the sort of liquid depths of Mary's body, just as the spirit from the liquid depths of primordial chaos yes. brings order. Um, so that the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary by the overshadowing of the spirit and the word of spoken word of God, becomes again a moment of new creation. This is when things start all over again. So in addition to the, what I call the overlay yes. in the Old Testament, you have another layer. Here is the human life 
which will be the ultimately restorative, recreative reality. Once again, brought into being by the hovering of the spirit, the overshadowing of the spirit to draw out an unexpected mystery. This is why you know, the, the doctrine of the virginal conception of Jesus is not um, some kind of mm, mythological fancy. Yes. It's to do with a deeply theological instinct yes. that Jesus truly is a new beginning. Yes, yes. And the Holy Spirit's direct involvement in that new beginning is key to understanding what's going on in, in Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. And that right from the very outset, you know, the, the darkness initially overcome mm. and the, the pattern and ordering of the days. So, you know, our days are quite bleak days. You know, we start at night, yeah. start in the darkness, period of light, and yeah. then go back into darkness again. And, and it becomes a cycle and a process of history, really, yes. doesn't it? Whereas yes. in this kind of Genesis chapter one, we've got evening and then morning, morning. Mm. the darkness overcome by the light. Right. How does that help us understand the story of history and the mm. place of mm. Jesus who says, I am the light yes. of the world yes. within that? Yes. Interesting, isn't it, that um, Jesus is called the morning star yes. in 2 Peter. And that, that that language has always attached itself to him somehow. And he says in Revelation, I will give you the morning star. Yes. Um, yes, as if at every point in our history, whatever night has fallen, something has changed because of God's faithful continuing work. The story of creation goes on as evening and morning succeed each other. So it's not just that you're slipping back to the evening before, but there, there will be a falling of the dark and the morning star will rise. There is no um, exhaustion or depletion of the life of the word of God in creation. So in the rhythms of our individual lives, our life as church community, our life as a global community, it's not entirely surprising that night falls, but the morning star continues to rise. And the hard thing sometimes to remember, certainly in personal lives, is it may feel as though, oh, I've been here before. Yes. Um, I'm just going around in circles. Actually, there's a spiral, you know, discovering more. The dawn that comes will be that little bit more yes. comprehensive and so on. That's what we believe finally, I think, about the sunset of our lives in death and the, the dawn that awaits us beyond that. I was fascinated, Christopher Booker, you know, the seven basic plots were just describing mm. the way in which all stories that we tell fall into a number of basic yeah. patterns. And then in the end, coming to say, you know, what is it that holds those basic patterns together and really saying it's the defeat of darkness by the light, the light. and the overcoming yes, of the light. Yes. Like that story which we retell in so many different forms, yes. but that story written right into the very fabric of creation right from the very fabric, outset. From, yes, and the very first words, let there be light. Um, and again, the, the fathers of the church scratch their heads a bit about how can there be light when there's no mm. sun or moon or stars? Yes. And the answer is, well, it is just the, the fiery radiance of God's presence within creation. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And when John says that this is the true light, it's the true light, well, light to everyone was coming, coming into, into the, the world. world yeah. mm. Mm. Do you think, in that sense, around the what happens in the fourth day with the creation of you know the sun, moon, and stars, that the sun in Psalm 19, you know, the, the bright, like a bride mm, groom running yes. across the sky, is it in a sense that the the S U N is created as a temporal mm. actor, in a sense, for the, the true and the yeah. eternal light of the world. It's such a recurrent image, isn't it? The sun of righteousness will arise yes. with healing, healing his wings, his wings in Malachi. Yes. Um, and it's, it's irresistible. The fact that here is the life that disappears each night and springs up each yes. morning. Yes, that th it's, it's a happy accident in the English language that we have the yes. same word. Yes. I'm not surprising that people, <clears throat> you know, people have used that in their imagery, their poetry about, about Christ. John Donne's poem, Good Friday Riding Westward, yes. beautiful, beautiful poem. 
about sort of riding towards the setting sun mm. on Good Friday. Yes. And all that goes on in his mind as he thinks of the sun setting and rising again. Yeah, very good. And of course, in the, um, the traditional Easter vigil of the church, the night before Easter, the night of Holy Saturday, what do we have there? We begin the readings with Genesis 1. Yes. And in the great proclamation of the Easter faith, the hymn that's sung as the Paschal candle is lit. Again, we say this light that we kindle, we pray that Christ will find it burning when he comes. This is a sign of the eternal light. It's yeah. not defeated. And in that, that great service, you move from the blessing of the candle, the blessing of the light, the, the acclamation of the new light, then you go into Genesis, then to Exodus and the passing of the yes, Red Sea, yes. then to Ezekiel's vision of the water streaming from the new temple, and then to the story of the resurrection itself. As if, again, you've got this overlaying. Yes, yes. And that story where the Bible begins with the, the darkness being overcome by the light, yes, yes. Christ, the light of the world, and, and where the Bible ends as well. Yes, yes. Exactly, there should be no light of sun or stars in there. The New Jerusalem, because yes. the Lamb is the light. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Talk to us more just about the structuring of creation, uh, moving on from the you know the, the beginning, <coughs> the light overcoming the darkness, mm. moving forwards in that way. The plural heavens, so not a singular heaven, plural heavens. You know, Paul the Apostle describing his experience, paradise, the third heaven, heaven, that understanding of mm. the three heavens. Mm. Talk us through that and just the. Hebraic concept of space and how that related mm. to the world. Once again, people sometimes reduce this to a rather crude picture. Well, the world sort of floats on the waters and yes. above is the dome of heaven. I think the, the writers of the first chapter of Genesis knew quite well they were taking some shortcuts for that. This is a poetic way of talking. But certainly the, the idea that um, there's more than one heaven is probably a way of saying beyond all levels of creation we can think about, the heaven of heavens yes. is, is God. Yes. But between the earth we know, the universe we know, the whole universe we know, and the life of God, there are levels of spiritual reality yes. which we can't begin to imagine. Um, and both Christian and Jewish, and for that matter Muslim, mm. writers have various accounts of what those different layers and levels might be. And that's a rather, um, I don't know, rather intoxicating thing to think about, that yes, yes. given the vastness of the universe as we know it, the thought that there are spiritual worlds even beyond that, and even that doesn't take us into the, the fullness of God's own no. endless light and life. But I think... Um, are physicists sort of stepping closer to these well, things or with dark energy, dark, dark matter? Energy. Are, they, are they touching the, <laughs> what, the, very, the outside you know, what, of an unseen creation? What fascinates me about some of this language in, in physics, dark matter and white holes, mm, the latest yes, yes. new thing, um, is the sense of what I call a... A happy floundering on the part of physicists, yes. you know, recognizing that there are aspects of the universe we're in that, that just cannot be captured with the tools we've got. Yes. And yes, just something of that, something of being oh, on the brink of something much, much vaster. And to make the point again, people talk about belief in angels and demons as if this was some kind of primitive folklore. But of course, what it's saying in the, again, very sophisticated, very ingenious and careful work of the great theologians is we are actually not the only agents in this yes. universe. Yes. And for good and ill, there are other agencies around which can open doors and close doors. Yes. And we ignore that at our peril. That yes. Our worlds intersect with those larger mm -hmm. spiritual worlds. Mm -hmm. And it really helps to, to be aware Yes. And to know, yes, to know where the help and the hindrance mm. might lie. With, Not that you get kind of 
obsessed with all that. There is, a, I think, an unhealthy interest yes. in angels and demons, and we know what that's like in some yes. madder bits of the church. Yeah. But just to say, well, when we say it, Holy Communion, therefore with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we should probably remember that that's not just a, yeah, a way of speaking, that we are, really are intersecting there. With that there are all kinds of forces and powers and, forces, and levels yes, of yes. work that we are almost entirely unaware That's of. That's right. But above all of that, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whom even the heaven of heavens or the highest contain. heaven cannot contain. Yeah, that's exactly it. So yes. even with all the, the grandeur yeah. of space. Yes. I always find that interesting that the, the sort of, well, at the time, the new atheists seemed to sort of bow before the, the grandeur and size of the universe. Yes. And we always wanted to say, it does seem quite big until you meet this person who actually mm. made it all, who it cannot even contain, even with all its size and That's right. splendor. That's right. That's right. And the, the awe at the scale of creation, I, you know, I read Richard Dawkins on that subject, I think, well, the man knows something about yes, worship. Yes, he knows yes, something yes, about I, the holy. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, that structuring which is given, how can that, that structuring which is given to creation itself also be shared in an individual life? You know, there's, there's so many people mm. who we struggle to get up in the morning, you know, we, we, we struggle to go to bed at the right time, we struggle to, to find <coughs> ways of getting through life, you know, mm. especially if during the pandemic, a lot of people just find all the boundaries and normal yeah, markers yeah. were gone. How can the, the structuring of reality by the living God yeah. help us just structure our daily lives, trusting him and following mm. him? I think this is where the, the model of the law in the Old Testament is actually quite important. As Christians, we, you know, we go with St. Paul and say, don't expect that in itself to deliver. But it's God, God's good gift. And it is so because it tells you that each act you perform is part of a policy of being present with God, moment by moment. And the, the ultra-Orthodox Jew, who today observes not only the commandments of the Torah, but the oral law yes. made out of the Talmud, all sorts of things, this is a person who is not being sort of oppressed and confined mm. by a lot of pointless regulations, but a person who has been liberated into realizing that everything you do can become a sacrament. Yes. Everything yes. you do can become a gift to God. Mm. And what an extraordinary thing that is. Look at Psalm 119, that great long hymn in praise of the law. How wonderful to know that we can in our daily life, in the most simple things, do something which connects us with God by doing yes. it prayerfully, thoughtfully, and generously. Mm. Yeah, now, that's, that's such a powerful... It's, it's a wonderful powerful thing. Reality, and that's, that's how to, to see the law, I think. Yes, yeah. And so easy to fall into what I think is one of the worst kinds of Christian triumphalism and say, well, mm. Judaism is law, Christianity is mm. gospel. Yes, yes. That's certainly not what Jesus believed. No, Jesus was an Orthodox Jew. Yeah, and Jesus, I, don't, I don't even think Luther thought that. Uh, yeah. I don't think he quite thought that either. quite, but I'm yeah. sitting near to it at times. <laughs> um, uh, yes, we're, we're in a different, a different environment here where, where the law is, is the promise yes. of significance yes. in and, and the ordinary can, things of life. And how can that help us, Ruin, in terms of the, you know, that process that describes the disenchanting of creation yes, yes. and that sense in which we, you know, if there are those two different versions of reality, uh, a, a poetic one or a yeah. mimetic one as well and you know it's either we're part of the story and yes. we're part of an unfolding meaning which has been granted being in life by the father son spirit or yeah. on the other hand there is no story it's just up to yeah. me as an individual yeah. to write it for myself and to make the most yeah. with the building blocks which yes. i've been given how can that help us negotiate yeah. those sort of questions the whole pattern of torah in the old testament creation law slavery, deliverance, all that goes with that. I think one of the things that says to us is we do not have to make up reality for ourselves. The burden of creating a self, creating a persona, creating a civilization, creating a morality, as if God says, no, actually, 
It's, it's simpler than that. Yes. For you to live is for you to slip into the harmony that I've prepared for you. Yes. It's as if you know, we, we come into a rehearsal for Handel's Messiah mm. and there are yes. massed choirs yes. singing in harmony yes. and we have with us a laboriously scribbled yeah. vocal score. Yes. And we sort of look up and ah, <laughs> there's something yes. much more interesting to sing. I know, absolutely, <laughs> yes, absolutely. We want to be a part of that. So we we much that. With, yes. so that the story which Jesus is writing yeah. is a much better one than any that we, we would yes. be able to yes. write for ourselves. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and the, the harmony of the world into which we can fit ourselves. Yes. Again, not submitting ourselves to an alien power, but finding where we belong. Yes. I love that um, old Shaker hymn, "'Tis a grace to be simple, "'tis a grace to be free, mm. "'tis a grace to come down where we ought to be." Yes. Yeah. And you think of the Shakers in 19th century America and their mm. ritual dances, and coming down where you ought to be, you sort of jump and yes, you land. Yes, absolutely. And to land. Yes. So well, you know, this is where, mm. it's where I belong. This is where I belong. Yeah. Um, and that has such a lot to say to our attitude to the created order. Instead of thinking of ourselves as distanced from the rest of creation, mm. and creation as a kind of supermarket where we just go and grab things off the shelves, yeah. which which we've done in mm. our Western civilization for such a long time. Yes. Instead of that, remembering that we are part of the, part of this story of creation, a very important part, yes. and we have a creative responsibility and a liberty which is, as far as we know, unique to our humanity on this planet. Um, but that doesn't take us out of yes. the system. It yes. gives us a very special responsibility within it. Yes, and, and how should we relate Rowan then to the supporting cast, if we were to put it like that, mm. you know, birds, fish, animals, yeah. the other creatures, Lewis, the jesters, playfellows, servants, you know, yeah. how, how are we to relate to? Yes, yes. Well, God looks at the world day by day in creation, sees it as good and eventually as very good. And we're made in the image of God. So if we're imaging God's vision of the world, we see it as good and we serve its goodness. We serve its well-being. Our own creative involvement in the rest of the created order must never be such as to undermine the fundamental well-being yes. of the ecology we're in. And I think that's, that's a really important implication of Genesis 1, and also quite a lot of the rest of um, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. A wonderful new book by Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg called Listening for God in Creation and Torah, mm. where he brings together these, these things absolutely beautifully. So, that, that helps us, I think, get some sense of how what you call the supporting cast is just as absolutely necessary to the whole story as we are. And if you want to pursue the theatrical analogy, if you don't have somebody who's keeping an eye on the lights, mm, yes, or managing absolutely. the curtain, you know, you're going to have a rather funny thought. <laughs> it's going to be a poor performance. It's going to be a poor end, performance, yes. And again, in, um, in the orchestra or the choir, you know, there will be more and less prominent instruments. Mm. Not everybody can be the first violin. No. But if you happen just to be the third timpanist, yes. banging your triangle or whatever, yes, you better get it right. Actually. Yeah, of course. And yeah. the rest of the orchestra has a responsibility yes. to help the third yes. timpanist get it yeah, right. Which, too. Whichever, yes. It, it, it's, um, yeah. Yeah. And the spirituality of creation in that way, Rowan, in, in which they are caught up and involved. You know, we think about Noah's Ark yeah. and you know, sort of they're involved in that. Yeah. Again, passing through the Red Sea, thinking about Jonah, thinking about the, the vision of the future of yes. Isaiah. So yes. it's not just simply humanity it's and the living God. No, no, it's we, like the whole of creation. The sense that the whole of creation is, is already involved in the praise of God just by being what it is. Yes. Um, there's that poem by George Herbert in the 17th century where he says at one point, rather surprisingly, would that I were an orange tree, that busy plant. It is. Then should I never lack some fruit for him that planted me. 
the world around us just does what it's meant to do. Yes, yes. And praises God by being what it does. It, it bears fruit for the God who planted it. We, in bearing fruit for the God who planted us, we have a longer job. Yes. Oranges don't have to work it out. Yes, we do. Yes, <laughs> and yes. that means that, of course, our working of it out is in some ways more spectacular mm. than the orange. At the same time, it can go immeasurably more badly wrong than the yes. orange. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So sometimes, whereas we think, we might think nothing else is in touch with God in the way that mm. we are, and we are the ones that have mm. this sort of unique relationship, mm. and that everything else is out of contact. Mm. In fact, in many ways, it's the other way around. Yes, like everything yes. else's relationship is much more straightforward, yes. and it's it's perhaps the human race and maybe one or two other outliers yes. that are out of contact, out of cont and out of contact, out of, the, out of context. The, yes, and the way in which yes. they've been made. Yes, I mean, in, in um, I think both Jewish and Muslim literature, you get occasionally this hint that the angels look on us with absolute bafflement. Yes. <laughs> In the Quran, you have that little episode where God tells the angels they're going to create the human race, and the angels think, why? Yes, <laughs> Bother yes, with that. Yes. What, a, what a pointless experiment. And God tells them he knows what he's up to. Yes. yes. And, yeah, yeah. that... that it, it's a theme, isn't it, in quite a few hymns and devotional texts, that the puzzlement of the angels. Mm, yes. Um, they look at us, and it's there, of course, already in, um, in the New Testament, mysteries that the angels long to look into. Yes, absolutely. Um, angels tremble when they see how changed is our humanity, mm, the Ascension Day hymns. Yes. And in vain the firstborn seraph tries to mm, pierce the depths of love divine. divine yeah in that greatest hymn in the English language. Yes, of course. Um, you know, that, again, puts us in our place, and our place in creation as human beings is glorious and incredibly risky. Yes. We can't lose sight of either of those. Yeah. And just as we draw to a close, Ron, if you just, just speak to that, the dignity uh, with which we as the human race have been made. Mm. I always think of, you say a bank note which has the image of the monarch or the president yeah. or the, the leader on it and the way in which in, you know, in many countries when hyperinflation sets in mm. it, it loses its yeah. value yeah. and you could be using a whole wheelbarrow of money to buy yes. a yes. very, very small, a yes. small thing. Yes. And when the, the image after which we were made is lost, again our value mm. drops. Mm. And it's the hyperinflation of human life. Yeah. But just speak of that it's dignity a, it's a we good model. It's with a, which we've been made. It's a good model, that I think, because it's a way of saying that when we forget about God, the next thing to go is humanity, yes. actually. It's not that, back to what we were saying earlier, that affirming humanity means less of God or vice versa. Mm. But when we stop thinking about God and what we're made for, in that sense, we actually lose our bearings in thinking about yes. the lasting dignity, the indestructible dignity of the human. I'd like to connect that occasionally with um, Jesus' response to his questioners when they ask about tribute to Caesar. Mm, and yes. Jesus produces the coins and says, you know, yes. whose image is yes, this? Well, absolutely. Give it to the person it belongs to. Mm. But give Caesar what is Caesar's and give God what is God's. Well, we bear God's image. Yeah, so what do you do? You give yourself and your humanity yes, to God, yes. just as you give the coin to Caesar, because the image is on it. Yes, That's where it belongs. Absolutely. So it's I think there's a, a very sort of subtle hint about yes, yeah, in that. the divine image and the, di absolutely. the divine dignity in us in that absolutely. little exchange. And to draw things to a closer, and so we, uh, we've been made after in his image and likeness. We give ourselves to him and what we bring to the table so often, mistakes, failure, yes. um, things which we've done in the past, yes. attitudes, thoughts, words and deeds. Yep. What, what is that, the glorious, you know, like rounding off of the gospel that we, we come to the, the, the living God with all of those things? And does he take us as, he are, as we are and does he give himself to us? And is there an exchange that can take place? We bring all that we are to God, failures and everything, warts and all. And God does not reject any of that, but he acts upon it. To bring these things to God is to say to God, I'm stripping my defenses, here I am, act on me. 
do with me what you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee, let me be laid aside for thee, John Wesley's covenant prayer. And in saying that, we allow God to work in us, which means we hope and pray that our sins and failures get just a little bit worn down by that encounter, and our capacity to speak for and act for and with God is that little bit enhanced day after day after day. Water dripping away at the stone. But it starts with that laying bare all that we are to God. Yes. Because God doesn't say, God doesn't hold his nose. Mm, so we yes, can't be doing with that. Yes, 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 God says, really? Okay, let's, yes. you know, let's get on with that. And it starts that, now. And in that great exchange, Ron, he gives us his life. He gives us his life. He gives he us forgiveness. Liberty, yes. He gives us his righteousness. Yeah. But best of all, most of all, he gives us himself. He gives us himself and he gives us the voice of his son to speak to him. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Ron. It's been such a privilege to be able to speak today. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time. Thank and you. May God bless you and all you're doing. Mm -hmm.